Hi, everyone, and welcome. We're going to give people um, about a minute to get in and get settled, um, and then we'll get started. All right, we still have some people coming in, but in the interest of getting through um, on time, I just wanna make sure that we get started. Um, welcome everyone to Introduction to Environmental Strategies, part one. Um, it is presented today by Chris Gabrielson and Sheila Nesbitt. It is also brought to you by the Great Lakes PTTC and SAMHSA. The Great Lakes ATTC, MHTTC, and PTTC are all funded under the following cooperative agreements from SAMHSA. This presentation was prepared for the Great Lakes PTTC, and the opinions expressed in this webinar are the views of the speakers and do not necessarily reflect the official position of DHHS or SAMHSA. The Great Lakes PTTC believes that words matter. The PTTC uses affirming language to promote the application of evidence-based and culturally informed practices. We have just some housekeeping details to go over with you quickly. Um, if you are having technical issues, please individually message Stephanie Bellman in the chat section at the bottom of your screen and she will be happy to assist you. Um, also, if you have questions for the presenters, um, there is a Q&A section at the bottom of your screen. Please put your questions in there. Um, sometimes if you put questions in the chat, we miss them because it moves very quickly. Um, you will be directed to a short survey after the second session of this webinar. So we have one today and then we have one on the 17th. Um, we would appreciate it if you could take that survey. Certificates of attendance will be sent out to all of you at the end of both sessions. They will be sent via email after the second session. Um, it usually takes about a week for us to get them all out. Um, you will be able to access the recording and the slides of these webinars on our website. If you would like to follow us on social media, you can use these for Twitter and Facebook. And our speaker today is Chris Gabrielson. Chris has worked in the substance misuse prevention field since 1991, so you are all in excellent hands and I'm going to turn it over to her. Hello everyone, welcome, welcome, welcome. So great to be on here with you all. And as Ann mentioned with that beginning slide, I also have somebody else who will be joining me in a little bit. Um, her name is Sheila Nesbitt, and we're gonna introduce her a little bit more um, when she comes on at that time. So thank you so much for joining me. I'm gonna start off with a poll. So um, let me, I'm gonna share my screen first and you'll see what the question is that way. And then Stephanie will pull up the poll. So, how familiar are you with environmental strategies for substance misuse prevention? Are you not familiar at all, very familiar, somewhat aware, vaguely aware? Uh, this will help us get an idea. This is an intro to environmental strategies. So, um, this is, I want to make sure we are focused in the right direction for this. So I'm seeing mostly a good, okay, about half are somewhat aware, vaguely aware, and uh, and vaguely aware and not familiar at all are about another a third or so. 
So it sounds like you all in the, are in the right place, the right webinar. This is very helpful to know. Um, so Someone Aware is a great place to start, as well as if you aren't familiar at all or vaguely aware, um, we will definitely start from the beginning, uh, but then move right into maybe a little bit more um, substantial details around environmental strategies. So thank you for, for participating in that. We'll go ahead and turn that off. All right, so let's take a look at the big picture here. Let's, you know, when we're thinking about environmental strategies for substance abuse prevention, let's look at it from, from this space first. All right, so who's familiar with the public health triangle? Anybody, uh, and I'm not sure with, feel free in the, to, the, oh, we can see raised hands, great. So some people are already raising their hand. Familiar with the public health triangle? All right, so some folks, so just a reminder for those of you, at least for me, I studied it. I have a master's in public health, studied at that time. That was a few years ago now. So let's do a little reminder. So the agent you'll see in that bottom left corner, let me pull up my spotlight here. So right here, this is the ex external agent of the force that's um, coming into play here while the host is what is susceptible to this agent. And then the environment is what brings the agent and the host together. So when we're thinking about individual prevention strategies, which we are often focused on, they're really focused on changing the host. Whereas the environmental prevention is looking at impacting the agent and the environment down here. So that is where our attention lies when we are looking at um, environmental prevention strategies, which we will be talking about today. So I'd love for you to pull up to their chat box if you don't have it already up. And I would like you to post in the chat box that if we were talking about addressing malaria using the public health triangle, the public health model, what would the agent be in that scenario? What would the agent be if we were wanting to address malaria? What do folks think? And it's not letting me pull up my chat box. <laughs> uh, a mosquito. There, thank yeah. you for reading up. I don't know why it's not letting me read chats. Thank you. Mostly mosquitoes. Someone said anopheles. I'm not really sure what that is, but mostly okay. mosquitoes. Great, and that's exactly right. In this case, the agent would be mosquitoes. Then who would be the host in this scenario? We were talking about addressing malaria. Uh, the people or person. Exactly. And then what about the environment? What kind of environment will we be talking about when we're talking about malaria and addressing malaria? The jungle, water, um, or outdoors. Right. And especially the water. It takes water, right, for the mosquitoes to um, lay their eggs and, um, and I'm missing the word prop propagate. Is that right? For some reason, that's escaping me. But that so that's the environment that would be conducive for those um, mosquitoes to to grow and to ha have more mosquitoes. Whatever that word is. <laughs> Somebody help me, please. All right. So then, if we were thinking about in our more current experience that we all um, are experiencing right now, what about COVID nineteen? What is the agent for COVID COVID nineteen? Virus. The virus, yeah, the COVID-19 virus, right? I, I guess I could have said pandemic, make it a little harder, right? All right, in this case, who's the host? People. People, exactly. And then what about the environment? Let's get, get a little more detail on the environment here. Some people said the body, someone said air. Yes, how is it transmitted? Think about how how is how does it, what's the environment where it's connecting the agent and the host? Because remember again, the environment in this case, it's the bringing the host and agent together. Um, some people said like enclosed spaces, community gatherings. Some people said um, like droplets, air droplets or uh, proximity when engaging with people, physical contact. Exactly, that's right, great. 
you all you all have this down so we're, we're in the right page okay so of course now let's bring this back to substance misuse prevention substance misuse prevention what's the agent substances or drugs it's, exactly so alcohol tobacco other drugs you know misusing prescription medicine all those kinds of things would be the agent who are, who's the host or what is the host the user or people people exactly people who would be misusing um those the agents the the drugs all right and then what's the environment in this case again a little bit trickier question at times community can be the community but what's can anybody get a little bit more specific someone said places where people use and someone said retailers or the anywhere where the substances are available. Exactly, because we're, well, and we're thinking about, again, connecting the host to the agent. So what, what is the context in which we're connecting the host with the agent? So we will explore that part of the triangle right here. This is what we're gonna be focusing on for the rest of this webinar, as well as the one next week. So how can we impact that along with their strategies that can go directly to impacting the agent? So. Um, really mostly focusing here with a little bit on there. All right, so let's look at a definition for environmental strategies. This, of course, there's many different ones, but this one says prevention efforts that aim to change or influence community standards, institutions, structures, and attitudes that shape individuals' behaviors. All right, prevention efforts that aim to change or influence community standards, institutions, structures, attitudes that shape individuals' behavior. So thinking about this bottom right here, that's, that's what it's defining. It's defining what that corner of the triangle is for substance misuse prevention. It's the community standards, institutions, structures, and attitudes that shape our behavior, our individual behavior. So what is an example of a community standard related to substance misuse? Can anybody put in the chat box what's an example of a community standard related to substance misuse? A policy or policies? A policy absolutely can be. Yep, that's an example of our community standards codified or codified, I believe is the correct standard. Uh, um, so, so go ahead. Uh, community norms, social hosting laws, um, stigma. Right, exactly. So community norms are, again, that's what is shared through our culture within our community of what is acceptable and not acceptable around using, misusing alcohol, tobacco, and other drugs. Exactly. All right, what are some examples of institutions in this case when we're talking about substance misuse prevention and environmental strategies? Schools? Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Resources or agencies, non-smoking areas, businesses that market substances, municipalities, communities. Great. Perfect. All right. What about structures? That's a little bit uh, different. We often don't use that word in substance misuse prevention. What do you think structures are in this scenario? Parks, buildings, places of use, uh -huh. abandoned homes. They can be, as well as the structures of how our community is structured, our government structured, our organizations are structured. We can, so it's both those levels because institutions, there's kind of, there's a crossover with that, but thinking about how our community is structured in terms of how our norms and our policies and our enforcement is enacted structurally as well. Okay, and one last piece with attitudes. What, what kind of attitudes could shape individuals' behavior when we're talking about uh, looking at environmental strategies? Perception of harm, parental attitudes, stigma, community norms, family and friends, and social acceptance. Great. You all are right on there. Exactly. All right. So again, we're thinking about that bottom right-hand corner of the triangle. We're wanting to impact it by impacting our community standards, institutions, structures, and attitudes. All right. So just way of restating this, environmental strategies are designed to change the context in which substance misuse occurs. So 
So again, it's the contacts that create that connection between the agent and host. We want to disrupt that. And that's what environmental strategies do. All right, so got a bunch of pictures on this slide. With number one, if you've seen this in your city or somewhere else, what would it, that number one, that footpath, be an example of an environmental strategy about? What, what would that uh, signify as, um, what are they creating? What environmental strategy is being enacted in this case? In general, not just for substance misuse prevention, in general. Uh, a protective factor of promoting health or healthy lifestyle. Exactly. Exercise. Exactly. Well done. Yeah. And it's removing barriers to engage in positive behavior, healthy behaviors. By creating footpaths, we create more opportunities for folks to be um, um, show and engage in healthy behaviors. So exactly. All right. What about number two? Affordable housing for everyone. What kind of what's an example? What's this an example of in terms of an environmental strategy? Someone said safety, improved health, housing stability. Exactly. Equity. And there we go. Yep. And if the, if people's basic needs aren't met, how are they able to address other things within the life? For example, if we are wanting to implement a parenting education program, but the population with which we are wanting to work, they don't even have stable housing, we aren't going to be able to deal with this, this issue up here when their basic needs are not being met. So again, that's an example of an environmental strategy. What about number three, soda tax? What's that an example of? Someone said New York. So uh, I'm assuming they must have, have it. Them, yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh -huh. um, policy shift, um, access restriction. And specifically what I'm thinking about with this one <clears throat> is that by changing the price of something, by increasing the cost, we see decreased use. So we see this in soda, we see this with alcohol, we see this with tobacco. So increasing the price of things decreases the amount of use. So again, thinking about agent and host, we're disrupting that by increasing the price. All right, what about number four? Are you familiar with all of that, uh, with 5210 strategy? Five fruits and vegetables every day, screen, hour, uh, screen time limited to two hours, one hour or more of active play and zero sweetened beverages is what that is about. What's this an example of? I will apologize ahead of time. Also, there's some construction going on in my building. So if you hear that, like, I apologize. Um, people <laughs> say a healthy lifestyle, uh, life skills, protective factors. Sorry. <laughs> That's no problem. That's the life of us in the pandemic. No problem. Uh, and I don't know why I can't see the chat box. Maybe, uh, Stephanie, if you can clue me in, I, I click on more and I click on chat and absolutely nothing happens. So, um, but I'm just going to do one more so we can move on. What about number five, speed bumps? What's this an example of in terms of an environmental strategy? Preventative safety awareness. And what is it preventing? What does it do? What, what context is it? Um, impacting between the agent and the host? A uh, barrier to high speeds, also a deterrent, um, slows people down and it helps control driving. It, yep, it helps slow down so that there are fewer accidents and fewer like pedestrian injuries, those kinds of things. So exactly, we're re reducing the speed so that we reduce the likelihood of accidents involved with vehicles. Exactly. All right, so these kind of strategies are all around us. Everywhere we turn within our community, we will see environmental strategies. Uh, what we want to do is we want to look then more specifically about what can we do with substance misuse prevention strategies um, to help, again, disrupt that between the agent and the host in that public health triangle. So a few benefits of environmental strategies include broad reach. We can reach a broad number of people with one strategy versus, for example, like parenting education program I mentioned before, you reach a small number of people at a time. That is, and we're gonna talk about, it's not that we don't wanna do individual strategies, but we have some uh, individual strategies that reach some group of folks, but we also wanna look at uh, the broad reach, broad reaching kinds of strategies as well. 
it's an efficient way in terms of reaching people, again, because of that broad reach. Establishes conditions favorable to non-use. So again, looking at those community norms, community standards, um, we can create those conditions favorable to non-use. And this is really important, enduring effects. So for example, policy changes, you put a policy change into place at one time, and as long as it's not you know, undone, it will last over, over the years. Whereas individual prevention strategies, you work with one group of, of people, and then you have to work with another group of people, and it's ongoing throughout time. So the, one of the very big benefits of environmental strategies is the enduring effects that they have. I'll write an example of an environmental strategy. I, I like looking at, at these kind of graphs to see, okay, what, what effect do we really have with environmental strategies? So back in the 1970s, some states started looking at decreasing the, or increasing, excuse me, the minimum drinking age um, to 21. And by 1988, all states were required to have a minimum drinking age of 21. Um, and that was due to a federal law that was put into place. So what we see, you know, once we hit 1988, it's somewhere right around here in the graph. We see a little spike, but then we see over time, it, it definitely dropped way down to about 20% and then has kind of gone back and forth over time, but stayed pretty steady. So again, the federal government changed uh, a law requiring a minimum drinking age of 21. That's not something that has to be done every year or every six months, it's just there. And it's had this long lasting enduring effect and a very broad reach. So that's a good example of an environmental strategy. All right, and I'm gonna go ahead and uh, move into questions. So um, if you would want, if you have any questions so far, please go to the Q&A pod that was mentioned at the beginning of the webinar by Ann. Um, and I would, will go ahead and answer a few questions right now and then we'll move on if you have them. If one thing that you might be able to try to do if we want to see if we can get the chat function working is you, you could try to stop your share and reshare and see if you can click it again. Um, I just want to throw you. that out there. Thank you. And I can see the Q&A, luckily. So um, I see um, one person commented, I certainly agree with the facilitator's comments. However, she assumes our current society addresses substance use with a public health approach. We do not. We approach it with a law and order lens. It might be more helpful of how we can make that paradigm shift. So that is a great point. I love this point. And I have to say, though, that, that how we approach it is our community norm right now. So I, I, think, I think we're saying the same thing in many ways, that we have to make that paradigm shift within our community norms of how we approach substance use and substance use disorders in particular um, with the law and order lens. So I think it's an excellent point and I do agree with it, but I, I think it actually fits within what I was saying as well. So I wish we could have a conversation in this setting, but <laughs> unfortunately we can't, but great comment. Thank you. <clears throat> Any other questions at this point? All right, I think we're good for right now. So again, feel free to uh, add any questions in that Q&A pod at any point, and then I'll stop every uh, 15 minutes or so to answer questions. And guess what? Magically, my chat box popped up after I closed out the Q&A pod. So I don't know what's going on here, but I'm very glad to see it. So um, I can now look at that as we go along. All right. So let's move, oh, as soon as I hit that, it disappeared again. Okay, we'll see if it comes back up or not. All right, so let's take a quick look at individual versus environmental strategies. So individual focused strategies are designed to help individuals develop the intentions and skills to act in a healthy manner. So again, focusing on helping individuals while environmental strategies focus on creating an environment that supports healthy behavior. So research tells us that the most effective of, of prevention programs are those that incorporate both of these approaches. So again, it's not an either or, it's that we wanna make sure that we are doing both. 
Um, so, for example, it's not enough to just convince a teenager that under, underage drinking is harmful or provide them with the skills to resist peer pressure. You can do that, but we might also want to make it more difficult for him to obtain alcohol in the first place. So by having both of those things going on, our chances of successfully preventing substance misuse increase dramatically. Few more distinctions between individual and environmental. So with individual, the goal is personal control of alcohol and other drugs, personal decisions. While environmental, it's looking at community control. Tools that are used with individual strategies are often in education kind of tools, support, small group activities. While with environmental, it's more media and policy advocacy, social pressure in that um, the larger sense of our community. The who, um, in terms of individual, educator and student, so it's often the pairing of, okay, let me help you understand this, teach you this, teach you the skills, look at shifting attitudes, etc. Or a professional and client, while with environmental, we're looking at coalition, stakeholders, community organizers involved in those actions and strategies and enacting um, what is going on with environmental strategies. So I'm curious to know, just to make sure we're on the same page of what we're talking about with individual strategies. If you could put in the chat box, what are examples of individual substance misuse prevention strategies? What are some examples? Uh, and if I click on the Q&A pod, my chat box popped up again. This is good. Okay. Um, education, psychoeducation. Now, social host ordinances are actually environmental. See that popped up. Um, wellness classes, responsible beverage services. Again, it's more of an environmental strategy. So we'll see how we fit in with that. Um, just say no was definitely an individual strategy. Found not to be effective, but it was an individual strategy, yes. Uh, mentoring, school programs, AA. So AA would be more on the treatment end, but it is an individual strategy. Life skills interventions, yep. Youth engagement, parenting classes, great. Great examples of individual strategies. All right. Okay, and I think that's in alcohol-free homes. That would definitely be an individual, could be an individual strategy, although it could be impacted by an environmental strategy, which we will talk about as we go along. Protecting you, protecting me curriculum. So yep, usually the uh, prevention curricula, almost all, if not all, I'm trying to think if that's an accurate statement, are individual-based uh, strategies. So great examples. Okay, nicely done. So let's turn our attention to how our environmental strategies um, impact, uh, our, how our environment is shaped, which then impacts how we are going to create and design and implement our environmental strategies. So our environments, you know, thinking again, that bottom right-hand corner of the public health triangle are formed through norms, availability, and regulations and enforcement. All right, so norms are what our society or community thinks and does. These can be unspoken norms as well as spoken norms. Um, and our norms are really society's acceptance or rejection of various behaviors, attitudes, and beliefs. So for, I like to think of the example with norms um, with what, what are the messages that our kids are getting as they're growing up as to what is acceptable with substance use? Is it, eh, it's no big deal, everybody does it, everybody is fine, or is it that you know, proceed with caution kind of thing? You know, if you're if you are a youth, not a good idea. Um, you will get in trouble if you get involved with it, et cetera, et cetera. So it's those spoken and unspoken, as I said, messages that our kids as well as adults get around uh, using substances. 
Availability. Availability. It, there's four different kinds of availability. So I want to make sure we're thinking about all forms of availability. Retail availability of how, how many people are selling. Um, for example, how many alcohol outlets there are and are they selling to underage youth? Where are those retail outlets located, etc.? So retail availability. Social availability. How are people getting their alcohol, tobacco, other drugs? Is it through other people in their social circles? Is it kids getting it from their parents, etc.? Economic availability is the third one. So we have retail, social, economic. Economic is how expensive is it to get it? So that's getting into when we talked about the soda tax example, where the greater the price, the less available it is for folks, the less people buy. And the fourth availability is perceived availability. And I find this one fascinating. So just the more, pe the more people think that drugs are available, alcohol, tobacco, other drugs, the more likely they are to use. So I find that hopeful in many ways because it can often, it might be more easily done to change a perception than reality in some cases. So if we can just change the perception of how available these are, we can have an impact. So the four are retail, social, economic, and perception. Four, four types of availability. And that third way of how our environments are shaped includes regulations and enforcement. And so it's what policies and laws are in place in our community and how they are enforced, if they are enforced. So for example, if we have a law in the books that if kids are caught with alcohol, um, that they are, um, you know, to get fined, their parents are called, or whatever the repercussions are, but if the enforcement is the sheriff catches them and they're like, ah, it's no big deal, I'm gonna pour it out and send them on their way, then that's when um, that's gonna have a negative impact and of course more use will occur. So that's regulations and enforcement. All right, get your chat boxes ready. Have a couple questions for you. So when we're looking at our environment, what are two individual factors that influence what we eat? What, what kind of things can impact us on the individual level? So you know, the information that we get as an individual, the choices we're making as an individual, what are two uh, individual factors that can impact us? And like, I was able to pop up the chat. I find if I click Q&A, it pops up my chat. So, <laughs> um, so location and cost, exactly. Availability, yes, the number of, um, but more specifically also like family tradition. Those are the kinds I'm thinking of in terms of individual factors. Um, ease of preparation, yes. Allergies, yes. Culture impacts what we eat, exactly. Those kinds of things that are individually going to impact us. All right, then what about, and I, time to prepare meals, I love these, exactly. All right, so then what are two environmental factors that influence what we eat? So what is going on in our context, in our environment, that are going to impact us? So if we think of, um, uh, let's say, oh, people are already fi fired up and ready to go. So food regulations, availability, availability is huge that we know that there are different uh, in different communities that have more access to healthy foods than others with and cost and availability absolutely um i'm seeing some uh, with family history that would go more into the individual factors food deserts that's that was the term i was looking for thank you ac um so a fast food availability, absolutely, again, if that's what's most available, it's going to be more likely to be eaten. Um, if farmer's markets, exactly, in terms of the environment, do we have access to healthy foods? Um, cheap, low-cost foods, yep, that it's not healthy, right on. 
So this is the same thing that we can extra extrapolate to the kinds of things going on with substance misuse in terms of what individual factors are impacting people's decisions around substance misuse, as well as what are the environmental things going on around the, in the bigger context that impact us. All right, just one more slide and then I have a quiz for you. That's actually gonna test me to see how well I've done. All right, one more slide. What we're going to spend the rest of the time on these two webinars is to talk about environmental strategies that impact this shared environment, this bottom of the triangle, the public health triangle. We're going to look at communication strategies, policies, and enforcement. So today we will tackle the communication piece, and then the next session we will look at policies and, and enforcement. All right. So let's see how well I have done in communicating with you all today. Uh, Stephanie, can you go ahead and pull up the first poll? Loved it. So are parenting skills trainings examples of individual strategies or environmental strategies? Let's see what folks think. So parenting skills training. All right, looks like most folks are thinking it's an individual strategy and that is true because we are looking at working with an, a small group of folks that we're working one-on-one -on -one with typically and we're working on changing their and improving their skills. That has nothing to do with impacting the overall environment of in which they are parenting. We're working with individuals to change and improve their skills. So that would be an individual strategy. Well done. All right, number two. Restriction of alcohol advertising. Would this be an example of an individual strategy or environmental? All right, it looks like, yep, I you are exactly right. Environmental strategy, because again, that's when we're impacting the environment. We're looking at what is going to be going on within our communities, what are we going to be impacted by within our environment? Well done. Next. Minimum age of seller laws. So setting the minimum age that you can sell alcohol, tobacco um, to, as on other drugs if you live in a state that offers marijuana. Or marijuana is legalized, I should say. Probably every state has marijuana available, but if it's legal or not. All right, correct. Minimum age of seller laws are environmental strategies, again, because that would fall into the policies and laws. Remember that third uh, category that we we're talking about with policies falls right into there. Okay, next. Social and emotional learning curricula. What about those? All right, seeing about 84% of you are thinking it's an individual strategy, which is correct, because again, this is when you are working with a group of individuals to train them on social and emotional skills um, and, um, and abilities. So again, we aren't changing the environment in which these kids are in. We're changing their ability, their um, knowledge and skills to be able to cope with what's going on with them. All right, next. And this is the last, uh, oops, we have two more. Second to last. Social host liability laws. And some of you might not be familiar with that yet. We will talk about those. So if you aren't, that's okay. All right. See, in the 90s, 93%, you're right. In environmental strategy, again, we're talking about laws, policies, broad reach, efficient reach, those kinds of things. We falls into environmental strategies. Exactly. And last but not least, we have Botvin's life skills training. What about that? All right, yes, 
you, I see 97% of you saying individual strategy. That is correct because again, we are not looking at impacting our the kids' environments. We're looking at enhancing their ability to make good uh, to use those life skills. So we're working with individual kids. We're not impacting their environment. All right, thank you. All right, and let's go ahead and answer a few questions before I'm finally going to bring in Sheila. <laughs> so Sheila has been patiently waiting. Um, so let's answer a couple of questions here. Uh, Jennifer says we have an issue with vaping in public schools and citations are not curbing this. Parents just consider a nuisance and pay for it and uh, pay it. Um, is this an example of social availability shaping the environment or regulation and enforcement? I would say yes. <laughs> it's not, it's both because um, the availability absolutely would impact it in terms of vaping, um, the amount of, you know, how easy it is for kids to get. Um, vaping, um, I want to say tools. Sorry, that's escaping me again. Um, and then um, also the regulation enforcement in terms of, for example, if they are doing it within the schools, what kind of enforcement are they doing within the schools? What's the punishment like? Is there follow through? All those kinds of things. Um, so good question and I um, hope you are understanding my answer. <laughs> All right, if I, and then next person says, if I understood correctly earlier, you mentioned social norms would fall under the environment. When we were reviewing the food slide and food culture was mentioned, I believe you stated that would fall under individual. Would you clarify and explain how cultural norms would differ from social norms? Oh, I love this question. So there are multiple sets of norms. <laughs> yeah, there's, there's the community norms that impact us and our decisions, as well as, for example, they're the family norms that would impact us. And so when people talked about their family history or their cultural history with eating, that's what I clued in on was looking at um, what is going on within our own communities, or excuse me, within our own families that impact how we eat. So for example, with my kids, you know, they have to eat their fruits and vegetables every day. <laughs> <laughs> you know, they, they have to do these kinds of things. It's expected of them. They know it. We talk about it every day. You know, and they're, they're teenagers now. They should know this by now. We still talk about it every day. You know, what's feeding your body? You know, are those chips really feeding your body as, you know, that in a healthy way? Those kinds of things. So the, there's the norms within the family as well as the broader environment. So that's where I was looking at the broader environment would fall more into the uh, environmental strategies category. All right, um, let's see, is there a risk with manipulating perceived availability? Um, not quite understanding that question. So if um, somebody, if Thomas, you can clarify that, I will get around to it at the next Q&A. Uh, we'll take one more question right now, cultural norms within the home would be different from cultural norms within the community. Oh, actually, yep, that's exactly, uh, you are you are correct. That is what I was trying to say. Hopefully I said that clearly. So we'll do the last one. In what way is individual prevention similar to environmental prevention? Um, again, I'm not quite sure what you're asking, but I would say the similarities are definitely that in the end, we're wanting to prevent substance misuse. So um, the, the ultimate goals, the outcomes that we're wanting to achieve are similar, but we are going to achieve them in different ways, either through the individual strategies or the environmental strategies. Again, feel free to um, clarify that for the next go around if I didn't answer it. Okay. All right. So now it is my great pleasure to, I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing here. Sheila Nesbitt is going to join me here. There she is. Welcome, welcome. So glad to have you here. And I have a few questions for Sheila. And the first one is going to be one she's going to share a little bit more about herself. So her first question is, can you share with us a little bit about the prevention role you have had when you've worked with environmental strategies? 
Hi, Chris. Hi, everyone. It's um, it's been fun actually to listen uh, to the session and. I know at the beginning, uh, several people indicated that they're very familiar with environmental strategies. Um, I, I'd say that's probably where I'm at as well, but I still find it fun and interesting to kind of get a refresher and think back about these things and what are some of the differences and some of those questions really got me thinking. Um, so it was good, but um, so my background, I've been in the substance misuse prevention field for over 20 years now. Um, and I've had a variety of roles, um, all of them, Pretty, pretty closely focused on environmental strategies. Uh, so I worked for a county health department for a while and worked on a social marketing campaign with populations of color. Uh, and then uh, I had a chance to work with a statewide coalition focused on alcohol policy change. Uh, I worked with uh, a number of local coalitions around the state of Minnesota. I'm based in Minnesota. Um, I worked with coalitions around the state uh, working with uh, local law enforcement around increasing enforcement of illegal providers of alcohol. Um, and I do want to say, um, I agree with that idea about we approach it with a law and order lens. And when I work on enforcement strategies, I really encourage people to focus on that access and that provider. Where's the alcohol coming from? Let's enforce that. Okay. I'm not going to run around and encourage you to run around and, and try and chase, uh, you know, students or, or youth, young adults or anybody. Um, you know, for behavior around their individual use, but let's focus on illegal sources or inappropriate, irresponsible sources of alcohol. So I just have to throw that in if that helps with um, some of that question as well. Um, but um, I think today uh, for this conversation, I'm going to focus on um, my more recent role, which was with a local coalition uh, serving nine cities uh, northwest of Minneapolis. So great. Some All of my right. background. All right, thank you. And so why did your coalition or this group of coalitions focus on environmental strategies? Um, well, the nine cities that we serve um, as part of the coalition uh, had a population of over 300,000. Um, so really, if, if it would have been hard for us to reach, uh, you know, a large number, you know, and any really measurable portion of that population with individual strategies to youth or families. Um, so we really needed environmental strategies because of their broad reach, like you had talked about. Um, we also, um, you know, even if we were in a community with fewer people, um, we know from the research that environmental strategies are more sustainable. Um, you know, we were grant funded. Uh, I think a lot of people working in prevention, um, you know, great if you have a, a base of ongoing um, funding and support, um, but a lot of us uh, deal with grant funding and grants come and go. We wanted to focus on strategies that would that would live past the end of the grant. Um, so that was a big focus for us. Um, we were also lucky that we had um, funders uh, that encouraged a focus on uh, environmental strategies. So drug-free communities funding. Uh, we had some, um, sorry for the acronyms, but the SPIF SIG, but you don't want to have to say the whole thing. Um, some funding from SAMHSA that really encouraged environmental strategies, at least here in my state. Um, uh, but that worked to our benefit because we knew that that was the direction we wanted to go. We didn't want to try and chase funding that had us doing something we weren't interested in. Um, so, but we were glad that our funders kind of backed that, that focus up. Great. All right. And what benefits did you see overall by implementing environmental strategies? Yeah. Um, so I, I think, um, you know, really what we're talking about is um, that we were able to put things in place um, that have lasted uh, longer than the term of the grant um, and be able to really focus on, um, you know, it is important that we recognize we're not saying either or. And, you know, Chris and I can say that a hundred times. I know some people will come away with that message. That's not what we're saying. Right. Um, but it is, it's kind of like the golden mean, if anybody knows of that philosophy that, you know, to, effective prevention is going to be in the middle, having both environmental strategies and individual strategies, but there's so often a focus on individual. It's, it's kind of what people know and what they um, immediately think of when they think of prevention. Um, so we kind of, um, you know, try and keep our focus on environmental strategies to make sure that we're meeting in the middle and finding that golden mean. Um, and so, you know, we really think we're, we're being more effective. Um, we aren't just telling kids, you know, and, and trying to educate them and give them skills, but have them in a community 
where there are underage drinking parties, you know, every weekend or that substances are really available and there's no consequences, um, you know, for people who are making that available inappropriately. So, um, so we think they really reinforce each other. Great. Great. And so do you feel like you've been effective at keeping that kind of that pull towards environmental strategies of, of getting that balance? Yeah, it, it, um, it can be tricky. <laughs> I actually, I joke with people that I don't think there are many, many people in the world who think they could walk into Starbucks and step behind the bar and become a barista. They feel like there's knowledge and skills they need to have in order to make coffee. Um, but there are a lot of people in this world who think they could step into prevention and they just know what needs to be done. And most often those ideas of what they know need to be done are a very you know simplistic education or something. And so I think there is kind of a natural tendency in people to think toward individual strategies. Let's talk to parents. If parents just knew, if students just knew. Um, and I think that behavior change um, and things that affect behavior are really so much more complex than that. Um, and so, you know, to me, it's important that we continually make sure that we're trying to educate people and, and keep that focus on environmental strategies. So there are a few things that we did within our coalition. Um, you know, partially, um, I, I can say, you know, knowing myself, knowing our leadership of our coalition, this view of environmental influence is truly in our bones. We get it and we understand it. When you talk about healthy eating, yes, absolutely. You know, we need to know how to prepare healthy foods, um, but there are so many things in the community that influence our behaviors around what we're gonna eat. There's so many influences in the community that are gonna affect so many behaviors. And I think when, when we realize that, um, I think people who care about prevention are naturally going to want to change that environment along with providing education and, and focusing on some individual strategies. So really understanding the influence of the environment and the importance of the environment is kind of number one for why you would keep that focus. Um, you know, second, we really make sure that it, that we are providing education, that we're bringing our coalition members along with us um, and, and that they know from the outset that that is an important aspect of our coalition so that they can make an informed decision from the beginning if working with us is a good fit. Um, and we meet a lot of people in the community that, you know, they want to do a health fair. They want to have, you know, a parent education evening. That's fine there's a role for that and, and we can work with you on that. Um, but that's also not going to become the only focus of our coalition. So we spend a lot of time saying, we're gonna have to choose. We have a little bit of time for this, but we also have to make sure that we have time for some of this other ongoing work um, around environmental strategies. Um, and then, um, you know, my third point that I'll say is, you know, sometimes we make our funder the heavy in our coalition to remind people like, hey, our, our funding requires that we focus on environmental strategies. Um, but we always make sure that we do that, not just blaming the funder, but we always try to communicate it in a way, the reason our funder wants us to focus on environmental strategies is that changing the environment is important. We need to make sure that we're making the healthy choice the easy choice. You know, we wanna make sure that we are trying to support the behavior change we wanna see in the community and that that is supported in the environment. So we always try to make sure and not just say, SAMHSA tells us we have to. Great, good point. All right, a couple of questions have come up um, with one is um, somebody was wondering about specific strategies, um, the policies, whatever you're doing. And I want, I want to let that person know I'm bringing Sheila back three more times. I mean, she'll also be available in the future Q and A's. Uh, but she is going to talk more specifically about what they have done with communication strategies, policies, and um, how did I just forget the third one? <laughs> the regulations and enforcement, communications. Yep, policy, communications, and um, enforcement, I think oh is the gosh, three that you... my brain. Thank you. Good thing you're here. <laughs> so we will bring her back to hear specific examples. So just to let you know that. Um, and Stephen also said, I like the golden mean framework, but isn't there a greater bang for the buck, so to speak, with a broader reach of environmental approaches? What do you think, Sheila? Yeah, I, I absolutely agree. I mean, that's a reason why environmental strategies needs, needs to be part of a comprehensive framework. Uh, when I worked for a statewide coalition, we were entirely environmental strategies. 
really was our focus. We were focused on statewide change around alcohol policy, um, but we certainly knew that we were not providing comprehensive prevention for communities. We were satisfying a piece. We had a focus. Um, and so we had a lot of local partners who were supporting parental education um, and, and doing other things locally. So we recognize that's, a, that's the bigger piece of prevention, but our role within it was more targeted. Um, for the local coalition that I work with, um, I would say, you know, we really, we would talk with our coalition about, um, you know, what is that right balance? Um, what is the balance between individual and environmental? Um, and, you know, a lot of ideas would come up and we would say, okay, and how do we reach 325,000 people with that? Not to be rude, but there are a lot of ideas that just did not make sense for the type of population that we're trying to reach. And so um, we would look for ways that they made sense um, and that they fit together, um, but, but really trying to have a, a smart focus. So I, I agree with you. I think there is a, a better reach. Um, there are good outcomes uh, with environmental strategies. All right, and we'll do one last question for right now because we want to make sure we get through the rest of the presentation. Uh, but uh, one person asked, to what extent do environmental strategies consider the historical role of systemic racism in creating the conditions, i.e. through policy, that lead to substance use, especially in communities of color? Which I think is an excellent question. I, it is an excellent question. And it, it impacts in so many ways. Drive around your community. Okay. Where I live in a suburban community, I have, I actually do have a good number of liquor stores around me, but I drive to other areas where there's a higher population of color and there's a concentration. This is clearly um, shown in the research across the nation um, that outlets are concentrated in, um, in lower income uh, communities with higher populations of color. What is it like to, to grow up around that? Um, to have that advertising focused uh, in your in your community, there's there's huge um, impacts from systemic racism on substance use, and so I think that is also a a really good way to say why we need to focus on the environment because systemic racism is is part of the environment. Um, so you know, so we we do a lot of that and. It's not exactly to your point, but this is something that it just, it sticks with me so often. Uh, we were meeting with a Minneapolis city council member. We were talking about some problem party houses that we had around the University of Minnesota. Uh, and this city council member said, I'm absolutely with you and working on this. He was an African-American man that represented North Minneapolis, but part of the area around um, the University of Minnesota. And he said, if these house parties were happening in my community and we had this number of African-American youth gathered, urinating, drinking, throwing beer bottles around, fighting with police, some of the things that we have that happen in our university campuses, it would not be allowed. But these are, you know, largely white college kids doing this and oh, it's just a frat party. That's kids will be kids. There's there is racism throughout this issue in a huge way. So all right. Thank you, Sheila. Great questions. I know there's lots more. I wish we could do every single one right now, but we are. I want to make sure we get through communication strategies and to hear Sheila's examples of what she has done. So, uh, Sheila, I'm going to go ahead and start sharing again. We'll see you in a couple minutes. All right. So I'm going to share my PowerPoint slides again. All right, so communication strategies. One of the categories of ways that we can um, impact our environment. So all around us, again, communication strategies exist on billboards, in advertising, in our social media, in um, what's going on around our community, et cetera. Communication strategies are happening all around us. So why should we use them? Well, for one, they help us change or reinforce community norms when we're talking about community norms concerning tolerance of alcohol sales to and use by minors as well as many other things in terms of norms. Um, we can increase the community's understanding of the problem. Sometimes there's not community readiness of, you know, that they're even ready to accept that there is a problem. To accept, promote, and enforce a policy or regulation by increasing understanding of the problem. So that's when it's going to work hand in hand with other environmental strategies. 
And last but not least, to increase a community's readiness to change based on this understanding of that it is a problem and needs to be addressed. So these are a few of the reasons to use communication strategies. We're going to focus on three communication strategies for the next few minutes. One is media advocacy, the second is social marketing, and the third are social norms campaigns. So let's look at media advocacy first. So media advocacy is the strategic use of mass media to apply pressure for changes in policy to promote public health goals. So the key words here are to apply pressure for changes in policy. So that, that's what we're really focused on with media advocacy. Media advocacy provides a framework for moving the public health discussion from a primary focus on the health behavior of individuals to the behavior of policymakers and corporate executives. So again, the key words here are behavior of policymakers and corporate executives. We aren't looking at impacting individual behavior with media advocacy. So the objective of media advocacy is to balance media coverage by emphasizing the social and economic rather than the personal and behavioral roots of health. All right, so three goals of media advocacy. One is to set the agenda. We're gonna shape the agenda of what's being discussed in the third community, what's being focused on in terms of being addressed. We are gonna focus on shaping the debate around what's going on with substance use and misuse. And we're gonna look at advancing policy. So let's, this, this um, table helped me understand the differences between strategic, uh, traditional media, media and strategic media advocacy. Let me pull up my spotlight here. All right, so traditional media focuses only on attitudes. Well, as strategic media focuses on shaping attitudes, affecting policy and building social movements. So broader than even just substance misuse. Traditional media focus responds and reacts to media re inquiries while at strategic media advocacy proactively seeks media attention. So you get a plan to proactively try to get that media attention. Traditional media can often be viewed as a threat while media advocacy can view as a useful tool. Traditional media responds passively to media framing and with media advocacy works to shape media coverage. And last but not least, defines problems from an individual perspective is traditional, whereas defines problems from a policy perspective is media advocacy. All right. I want to point out this resource that's available. The website address is down here and you will be getting copies of this PowerPoint slide so you can you will have this or you can just Google the name of this document strategic media advocacy for enforcement of underage drinking laws. This is specific to underage drinking. However, great information in here. That's where I pulled out the table from the last slide as well as there's lots of fantastic information on implementing media advocacy strategies. So before we get to that, nope, let's go ahead and move on. Never mind. We'll, we'll keep moving. <laughs> All right. Social marketing. So we're switching from media advocacy to social marketing. Social marketing is looking at disseminating messages that reinforce the benefits of engaging in a behavior while minimizing the perceived negative consequences associated with that behavior or that behavior change. This is... These are the typical communication strategies that people often think of when talking about substance misuse prevention and using the media. These, and I'll show you some examples in just a minute. I'm sure, sure that you will know, you will recognize some of them. So with social marketing, we're working to influence community attitudes and norms about substance misuse. So here's some examples. Parents who host lose the most don't be a party to teenage drinking, it's against the law. So that's, that, was, that is a social marketing campaign trying to, to shift that norm around parents thinking, well, my kids are gonna drink anyway, so I might as well have them all here where I know they're safe. That 
can be a community norm and or is a community norm in many communities. So these social marketing campaigns are trying to shift that norm, working at shifting this norm for parents to understand that no, still, that's really not a good idea. You might think about uh, something else in terms of how to keep your kids safe. Another example, parents who do make, you do make a difference, you can prevent the risks of early substance use by your kids and we can help. And then they have information on where to link to go for more information. So in this case, it's trying to, to shift that norm of, oh my gosh, well, they're a teenager now, there's nothing I can do, whatever, you know, that kind of attitude to know you still do make a difference. You can, you can take action and make an impact. Let me show you an example of a, uh, a social marketing campaign. So specific, and I'm going to need to stop sharing. I'm going to switch over here. Make sure that the sound is coming through. All right. Oh, hey, bud. Oh. Where, uh, where are you headed? Uh, I'm just going to hang out. It's a school night. With Gary and Todd? Yeah. Not sure about those two. I've been meaning to ask you. This is tougher than I thought. Is there any drinking going on in this crowd? No. I hope not, because alcohol can lead you to say things and do things that you really wish you hadn't. Isn't this what you're supposed to say? I know. So if any of your buddies ever pressure you to take a drink, just tell them you promised your dad you wouldn't. I'd do anything to keep you safe. Okay, I will. I hope this is working. I promise. Love you too, Dad. They really do hear you. Ryan. Yeah? So start the conversation even before they're teenagers. Good idea. For tips on what to say, visit underagedrinking.samsa.gov. A message from the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration. Oh, hey. All right, so go to the chat box and share why do you think that is a social market a social marketing campaign versus a media advocacy campaign what is it looking to impact that specific commercial what are they hoping the people behind designing that what are they hoping will happen in terms of a behavior i see it's impacting individual strategies they want parents to speak to their kids you like the internal monologue i do too Especially as a parent, I'm like, oh yeah, I know that internal monologue. Yeah. They're hoping parents will have a conversation with their kids. Exactly. They're wanting them to talk. So the behavior change is don't be too afraid. Go ahead and do it. Talk to them. All right. So exactly. So they're looking for individual behavior change. It's not media advocacy because they are not advocating for a policy change or those kinds of situations. They're looking to change an individual behavior by an individual person. Exactly. All right, so I'm going to share my screen again, and I'm going to do it this way. I am hoping. All right. Can you all still see my, uh, my PowerPoint slides? Yes. Thank you. I, I went through a different way, so hopefully I won't have to stop sharing again. Thank you. All right, so social norms campaigns use scientific evidence to promote accurate, healthy norms about alcohol use. And again, as we mentioned before, the objective is to correct misperceptions regarding substance misuse by modeling and promoting healthy, protective behaviors that are the actual norm. Oh, what am I doing? <laughs> My brain just clicked in that we switched to a different one. A little slow here. All right, hopefully you all are, are more awake than I am at the moment. You have to understand, I'm out in Oregon. So, you know, it's still, is it still morning time? Oh, nope, I have no excuse. It's 12.08 here now. No more excuses. <laughs> All right, so social norms campaigns. We're switching from social marketing to social norms. Hopefully the rest of you clicked on quicker than I did. So social norms campaigns, I'm gonna say this again. We're gonna use scientific evidence to promote accurate, healthy norms about alcohol use. So the key is to promote accurate, healthy norms about alcohol use. Okay, so then going back to the objective, to correct misperceptions regarding substance misuse 
by modeling and promoting healthy protective behaviors that are actually the norm. All right, and that's those are again key words. So you're trying to to correct misperceptions to the actual norm. All right, so the key key information there. So I'm going to show you another video which will help provide more information about this uh, correcting these uh, these norms. I'm going to switch over here. And social norms are standards for what is typical or desirable in a given situation or group. For example, that most people in a community support recycling or gay rights. We know from decades of research in social psychology that people tend to bring their behavior in line with what they understand to be normal around them. The issue is that people are often inaccurate in their understanding of what's normal. People don't always have good information about what everyone is doing. They can't observe everyone at all times. And so you may have a workplace where everyone is privately thinking, hey, sexual harassment is not okay. I'm personally really not okay with this. But if no one is speaking up about that personal attitude against sexual harassment, it can continue to happen and um, appear to be normal in that setting. So people's perception of what is normal around them ends up being really influential and really important to target. A lot of programs have taken the approach of trying to change people's personal attitudes and personal beliefs on a topic. We can think of diversity training programs in the workplace, and the approach of these programs is basically to try to persuade people or educate them to think differently on a topic. And that turns out to be really difficult to do because people's personal attitudes and beliefs are often rooted to experiences they've had and to belief systems that they hold. And additionally, we know that people often don't act in line with those behaviors in any case. Their behavior is sometimes disconnected from what they personally believe on an issue. So people are sensitive to cues about how others might react to what they do. They often act more in line with what they see as normal than what they personally think. The studies that we reviewed and our own research play off of the sensitivity that people have to cues in their environment about what is expected of them. And rather than try to persuade college students that binge drinking is unhealthy, for example, a program might try to reveal to them that their peers actually don't support binge drinking as much as they thought they did. So that's where a norm change intervention can come in and be powerful. All right, so I'm going to switch back to the PowerPoint slides. So that's an exam a great explanation, I thought, of the social norms campaigns of, and why we would do those. So here's an exam a few examples of some social norms marketing campaigns materials, so some print materials that have been developed. 90% of TH students do not drink when hanging out with friends. So again, the norm that they found through research, again, this is the research base, they've done surveys and they found 90% of the students do not drink when hanging out with friends. Now the perception might be at that school, and they would also have collected this through the research, is that you know, kids may think that, oh yeah, no, I think that probably 90% of TH kids do drink with the, when they're hanging out with friends. So they would be working on shifting that norm and perception to the accurate perception that yeah, most kids don't drink when hanging out with friends. Another example is nine out of 10 TMS students did not drink alcohol in the past 30 days. And one more example is 99% of you have never been arrested for DWI, DUI, and this is for a college. Um, so, <clears throat> excuse me, sometimes you want to fit in is the key, is the message here. <clears throat> so again, they're looking at, okay, drinking and driving is not the norm. If you want to fit in, you will not drink and drive, okay? All right, I'm going to skip over. I have another video here. We are running out of time, but I encourage you when on your own to go ahead and watch that. It's just a couple minutes, but um, you, that's an example of a social norms campaign video if you want to see a, a video. 
All right, real quickly, and we're going to bring Sheila back in then, is we're going to talk about the differences between these three. So social marketing, again, is looking at individual behavior change using commercial marketing strategies. Social norms campaign also is looking at individual behavior change, but they use data to correct a misperception about a positive norm in your community, such as a no use norm, you don't drink and drive, etc. With media advocacy, the goal is community level change through policy, and it uses media strategically to gain public and policy maker support for policy goals. Okay. Few ways to increase your effectiveness of communication campaigns. Combine them. If you can combine media advocacy, for example, with a social marketing campaign, it can be much more, um, more much more effective, more intensive, and um, also um, combining them with individual strategies, as we talked about, can be very impactful. Another way to improve the effectiveness of communication campaigns are to prevent messages that appeal to young people's motives for and per perceptions of misusing substances. So again, that research on what those messages should be will be extremely important when looking at implementing communication campaigns. Of course, of course, of course, tailor messages to the audience. Um, place messages where young people are likely to see and hear them. Of course, that's very different right now in a pandemic than other times. So if you're going to do something right now, that's going to be of even more importance than usual. And I'm going to go ahead and combine this Q&A with Sheila's Q&A because I want to be sure to bring her in. So um, I'm going to stop sharing and Sheila, if you'd like to join me, I want to hear from you again. Hello. <laughs> All right. So what everybody wants to know is what communication strategies did you use in your communities and why did yeah. you use them? Um, our coalition was concerned about prescription drug misuse and opioid abuse. Um, and we had a number of strategies focusing on that, right? So you don't start with your strategy that you select, you identify what's the issue in your community you're working on. Um, so ours was prescription drug misuse. Uh, and we had a variety of strategies we were working on, including um, promoting disposal um, locations, uh, working with the prescription drug monitoring program. Uh, but then we also included some uh, communication strategies. Uh, so we did a social marketing campaign uh, that focused on um, messages around uh, disposing of unused, unneeded um, medications. Great, great. And how did you implement them? What did you do specifically? Yeah. So we started with a fairly traditional uh, a campaign, a social marketing campaign. Uh, we developed uh, some messages, the creative around it, uh, worked with a firm to do that. Uh, we had a billboard, uh, we had newspaper ads, we had some Facebook ads. Um, and what I think makes really good sense with doing prescription drug uh, issues, we created a package insert that pharmacists would include uh, with the medications um, uh, when handing them out. Um, so that aspect of the cam campaign was really geared to the general public, you know, people who are receiving uh, prescription medications. Um, but then we uh, expanded or continued really, I guess you'd say we, we kind of narrowed the campaign uh, and really focused on some messages specific to prescribers themselves. Um, again, because we have this environmental focus, um, I would say, you know, we really try to look to how do we, how can we gear a social media campaign that's gonna reduce some access or, or look at some issues like that. Um, so, and we really wanted to enlist these um, prescribers as resources um, for our work. Um, so we developed campaign materials, kind of another aspect of the campaign that had messages specific to prescribers themselves around what they could do um, to help uh, really um, reduce prescription drug misuse. Um, and I think one, um, one nice piece of this, uh, we enlisted our coalition members to help hand deliver packets and have a brief conversation uh, with these um, prescribers. We're in a pretty large community, so we couldn't go everywhere. But when we looked at our student survey data, and we talked with healthcare providers, they really helped us prioritize dentists and pharmacists um, 
pharmacists as being, you know, a, a you know, a concentrated location where people are picking up their medicines, um, but also that dentists in our area, at least, tend to be a lot more sole practitioners. Those who were involved in a larger healthcare system were getting these messages and resources through their health system, but sole practitioner dentists um, were maybe not, or at least that was the concern and why we prioritize them. Um, and you know, those coalition members who really like to do health fairs or you know like to do individual strategies, they were great for us to be able to engage. Here's 15 packets. Here's a list of places. Can you go deliver them? Um, and and you know, it was um, a nice way uh, to involve them. So that's a little information about our campaign. Great. And what kind of outcomes did you see from it? Yeah, um, well, uh, we had a number of process outcomes uh, for our campaign. Uh, so our campaign included um, Facebook ads. We had um, 32,000 impressions uh, from our Facebook ad that, that came from $500 worth of cost. Um, so $500 worth of ads got 32,000 impressions. Um, more than 1,000 people clicked on that link um, in the ad to be able to get information about their closest um, disposal location. Uh, we saw a 9% increase in the weight of the prescription medicines that were coming through our disposal boxes uh, from the beginning to the end. Well, we actually did year to year. Um, so a year prior to the campaign and then post campaign. Uh, and then, you know, we also have seen some other outcomes around um, reductions in uh, students reporting prescription drug misuse, uh, reductions in opioid overdose and fatalities. But when we get to that level of outcome, I am not going to attribute that to a communication campaign because we really do have a lot of strategies working on this. So I'm not saying that our communication campaign led to that communication campaign increase in disposal locations, work around our prescription drug monitoring program, and a whole variety of things have worked to, to, to lead to some of those longer term outcomes. Fantastic. That's great. All right. Well, are you up for answering a few questions here? Are working with me on them? I think so, yeah. Okay. All right. One is how do you differentiate between the information dissemination strategy using a camp media campaign and the environmental strategy of a social marketing campaign? So I think, I think yeah, do you want to ahead. take that, Chris, or no, do you want me ahead. to? Go ahead. Um I, I will say I think the water gets very murky. Mm -hmm. I think it can get very hard. When I talk with people, um, especially, right? I've, I've worked with a lot of coalitions and I see this. My funder told me I have to do an environmental strategy. So I'm going to do one. And then they choose a communication strategy because that's a lot of people feel easier. Believe me, it's not. Truly to do a good, strong uh, communication campaign is a lot of work and it is hard. Um, but um, I, I have seen this time and time again where I have to do an environmental strategy. So I'm gonna pick communication campaign and then they, they, it's, it's, it really borders more on information dissemination. They have um, pretty simple. So um, the key things to look at is are, how broad of a reach, are you truly reaching the community? So, you know, I have 300,000 people in, in the region that I serve. Um, one billboard doesn't cut it. Uh, one newspaper ad doesn't cut it. Uh, you know, we had a bill, we had, we've had multiple billboards, um, newspaper ads ongoing with a changing message. Um, I really recommend, you know, work with professionals in this, in the same way, I'm not going to walk into Starbucks and try and make a latte for you. Um, I don't want somebody walking in thinking they're going to, you know, design a whole prevention campaign, but I'm also not going to design a communicate communication campaign without some communication experts, either engaged as volunteers in the coalition or, you know, we hire and, and work with a firm ongoing. Yeah. So those are some of the ways I think that you can help make sure that you have that reach. Chris, what do you want to add? Well, and I would say information dissemination is an overarching category and social marketing campaigns fall one piece under it, but it's a much more of a specialized, just use, like you said, where my mind went was I remember the first social marketing campaign I was involved with it was a, there was a lot of research, Aliyah, a lot of research on the target audience, on the messaging, on how the messaging is received, and you know, there's all these things that go on, like the you know, the Starbucks. I love the Starbucks analogy, um, that I would not have had the knowledge to do at all. 
versus like regular kind of run-of-the-mill information dissemination that I see usually going on with prevention programs are you, know, you create a flyer and hand it out with the you know, lunches that are sent out you right now with brown bag lunches that are handed out or things and there's not the the whole scientific design behind how you're going to make that behavior change so yeah and I think that focus on behavior change is a key piece as well. Like for our communication campaign, our behavior change is that we wanted people to dispose of unwanted medicine. We heard specifically people keep them for a rainy day. I paid good money. And we had a lot of research on that. And we wanted to make sure that people understood the importance of disposing of their medicines and that they understood that those disposal locations were nearby. We have them throughout the community, many, many locations. It's actually very easy to dispose of. So if you go back to that definition around, we're trying to overcome the, you know, the perceived consequences or the barriers to that behavior change. Um, so to me, you know, some of the information dissemination is, is a more, you know, um, you know, here's information about substance abuse and here are concerns and here are problems. And we want you to know this information versus we're going to give you information to make it easier for you to change your behavior. Great, thank you. All right, I think we have time for one more question and I wanna make sure we answer this one because I may have created some confusion for folks. Uh, this person asked, did I understand correctly that social marketing and social norms campaign are not environmental because they focus on individual behavior change and media advocacy is environmental because it focuses on community level change. Great question. I'm sorry I created that confusion. Sheila, would you want to tackle that? So maybe you can say it better than I. Sure. Um, so I can say that, um, you know, in, in the framework that we're using, these are all considered environmental strategies if done appropriately. But that is a gray area. And I, I can say there are times I, I've looked at things and I, I've said, you're, you're calling it social marketing. I, I don't think this is the strongest example of social marketing that I could see. Um, so, you know, to me, um, we are saying these are environmental, but you have to do them in a way that you are trying to change something in the community. Um, trying to change an expectation that you're reaching enough people that they have this message and that behavior will change at a population level. So, uh, you know, to me, um, I, don't, I don't lead with a communication strategy. So if we're concerned about prescription drug misuse, to me, the answer is not a communication strategy, um, most likely. I am going to have other environmental strategies that we're working on, and then a communication campaign comes in to be part of that. So we're going to make sure that it is easy for dis people to dispose of medicines. We're going to make sure that we have boxes throughout the community that are permanent, that are there. Um, and then we're going to have a communication campaign that can encourage people to use them. So those two fit together. Yeah, so. and so I think in environmental strategies in general, what we are looking at is a change of, beha of in individual behavior. I mean, ultimately, we're wanting people to not choose to use, misuse substances. So ultimately, anything we do, that's the ultimate outcome is we want to see that. We want to see that at a community level that individuals are making those choices. So like with social norms marketing, we want to see individuals changing their behavior um, in terms of not using, but we're doing it in an environmental strategies way that we are going to look at, for example, if it's a college campus and we're looking at shifting norms there, we are doing a college campus wide campaign. It's not that we're going to take these 10 students, sit down with them and talk about, okay, how do you perceive that, you know, your fellow students doing these things? We are looking at doing a, a social norms campaign with, um, with, it could be billboards, it could be handouts, it could be flyers, it could be uh, videos, whatever it might be to capture the whole community. So hopefully that's, that's why it's, and it is an environmental strategy. <laughs> That's what I'm trying to say. So hopefully that clarified a, a little bit. Unfortunately, we are out of time. I know we have more questions. We do have next session to continue to talk about things. So if we didn't answer your questions, um, please bring them back for next time. We are going to focus on a couple more areas. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen here and Oops, there we go. 
All right, so for next session, we are going to talk about policy strategies, enforcement strategies, selecting the right environmental strategy for your community, and resources on environmental strategies. We're missing a couple hyphens. I apologize. <laughs> um, so that is going to be the focus of next week's webinar. Um, I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing. Any last thoughts you would like to share, Sheila? No, just thanks for everyone, everyone for the interest in the topic. I, I think it's a, a good one for us to, you know, keep talking about. It's always hard to figure out what you're going to be working on in your community. So. All right. Thank you, everyone. Great to have you here and look forward to seeing you next time. Take care, everyone.